Anyways, I'm Zach Dickhausen, Natural Resource Coordinator here at the district. Started out seven years ago as an intern and then um, ended up doing data collection for several years with Josh, kind of slowly transitioned into this as we started building this wetland program. Um, one of the first things I did as actually an intern was um, taking in lots of uh, survey data and such from you know, citizens and whatnot about things they're interested in. And one of the big things that kept popping up was wetlands. And so over the course of those next couple of years, that was one of the things we talked about was you know starting some sort of you know designated wetland program. And um, that's what I'm gonna talk to you guys about tonight is kind of sort of what I do, what our wetland uh, program sort of entails. And then, you know, after that, you guys ask me questions about it because I'm sure there'll be a whole bunch, but yeah. All right, so um, I like to categorize the sort of things we do in the three main categories of uh, wetland activities in the district, and you know, there's lots of sub things within that. But it is that um, our wetland restoration program, which is uh, going to have lots of sub parts and to probably when I've spoken with some of you guys, um, you'll probably recognize lots of stuff that I talked to you about what I do in that section of it. Um, stuff has to deal with wetland conservation act, so enforcing that um, sitting on board uh, committees, you know, to help um, cities and other. Um, groups around the district for that and then um, assessment specifically for district projects. So any sort of district project that we've done, if there's well, it's within the city, we do lots of assessments within that. That didn't like it to that point, though, but. All right, so we'll start with that restoration program. And so this is kind of one of the big pushes for just having a wetland program is to have sort of program that's sort of dedicated to identifying these areas with areas within the district to have wetlands historically have had wetlands. Um, and finding, you know, would be some key areas within the district where we can restore some of these wetlands, rehabilitate them, uh, create some new ones, and, you know, have these big sort of projects, kind of like, you know, some of these big creek projects that lots of you are familiar with that we've done before. Um, so similar to that. Um, so a big part of that is establishing management classifications to be used for deciding which one of those are going to be kind of, you know, higher up on that scale for choosing and such. We'll get into that just a little bit more here. Um, and we also use those for regulatory purposes as well. Um, and then um, another kind of you know benefit of that then too is getting you know just catalog, catalog all the sort of identified wetlands within the district. So quite a few, um, even more when you start to, like, including stormwater ponds in that. But that's not necessarily what. Um, and then yeah, the overall goal then improving wetland functions just across the district. You know, with the goal of not only improving you know all those wetland functions, but all the downstream functions of other water bodies and such too, and just overall improving water quality. So um, we started conducting wetland assessments, so actually going out and assessing wetlands individually 2018 in the field. Um, one of the main tools we use for this is the Minnesota routine assessment method. Um, it's a rapid method. Um, we'll get into that just a little bit here then too. But uh, rapid assessment method that you can go out and do a wetland assessment within a day. Um, combination of that and some uh, some remote work, you know, doing some measurements and such using GIS software. Um, in 2020, end of 2020, 2021, we added in the floristic quality assessment, um, which is just a more bolstered plant assessment tool that we use to um, kind of work along with the uh, routine assessment method, just kind of have something a little bit stronger to use for that plant community part of those functions. And then, like I mentioned, there's lots of remote sensing and assessment we do that combines with that. Um, that also goes into our cataloging and inventorying of this. Uh, yeah, and as of this last summer here, we've assess the majority of identified wetlands in the district. There's a couple here and there's, you know, little tiny like ponds and such and golf courses and such that might, you know, have been maybe missed or have not been high, high priority um, and things like that. And that includes also a, a big round then two over the last two years of doing some QA, QCs on those as well. So going out and doing quality assurance, checking, redoing some of the early ones. Um, and then the next couple of years, yeah, I'll be going out and I'll be doing that floristic quality assessment, a big chunk of Chan Hassan because that was assessed before we started using that as a tool. Yeah. yeah. One thing. So, Andrew, on these learning presentations, unless it's changed, we don't. You don't have to recap the presentation because that will. There'll be a link to that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As long as it's you know picking up here, then too, it should be recording fairly well. But the audio for that, but yeah. <laughs> I do it a lot. I know. Sorry. No, no, no worries. 
Um, so yeah, I will really quick talk about um, some of these assessment methods. So that routine assessment method, we call it MinRAM, so you might have heard that thrown around, um, was developed by um, inter some interagencies like uh, Bowser and some other agencies to be used as, like I said, a rapid assessment tool, rapid assessment meaning you can go out and you can um, do an assessment on a water body, in this case, a wetland, you know, at one go, it's a field day, you know, and sometimes, you know, depending on how big they are with this one specifically, you know, I can do several of these MinRAM assessments, at least, you know, the field part of it within a day then too. So that's uh, the idea of it being rapid. Um, so pretty much the idea of it, you're documenting those wetland functions and characteristics. So looking at things like the wetland hydrology, the downstream hydrology, what's it doing and what's it, you know, flowing to downstream water bodies, um, water quality things. So once again, downstream water quality, water quality. So what's coming into it, you know, pollutants and things like that, all those uh, sediment loading, whatnot. Vegetative community habitat and it looks at different types of habitat, um, kind of your big macro fauna. So deer and things habitat looks at fish habitat, amphibian habitat. There's uh, actually I actually have a, a slide in here that shows kind of like all the different functions and such then too. So um, I'll let you guys look at that then too. We can talk more about that if you have more questions after this too. There's quite a few few functions categories for this, but um, yeah. And so along with um, that and the remote assessment thing, so measuring specifics like, you know, where is the nearest downstream water body? You know, and we actually will take measurements and get, you know, approximations of how far that is. And that'll give different categories of, you know, is it you know, helping downstream water quality a lot based off that measurement, you know, sort of or not so much, things like that. Um, we also do things like, you know, taking wetland measurements of, you know, the actual area, um, things like, uh, different wetland plant community measurements and to find out those proportions. So yeah, and then we um uh the district uses specifically a form. It's um so initially when this was created, there was a couple different forms that were developed over the years. Development of these stopped back in 2010, I think, of MinRAM by uh, state agencies. And so we have uh, we had an old form of Microsoft access form. Uh, storage characteristics and some other things that are kind of more pertinent to our permitting program. And it, it calculates those along with the assessment and gives us that overall management classification, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah, and here's some of those functional categories. Actually, I think that's all the functional categories, and these break down into smaller groups then too. But. All right, and then like I mentioned then too, one of those things as part of that assessment is the uh, vegetative community assessment. MinRAM is pretty, you know, basic and more kind of looking at, you know, high level stuff. So taking a quick look, assessing a couple, you know, major like overlooking aspects of it. And so for some of those things, uh, we wanted to kind of get a little more in depth. And so source quality was one of those things. And this is a great tool uh, developed by MPCA. This um, can be pretty specific. So it's looking at what do you see in the wetland? You know, you go out and you do a, you know, zigzagging transect in the wetland and you write down everything, writing down proportions of what you see about and everything. And then that can give you um, a uh, floristic quality index, which is a score based off of everything you see in the wetland. What is it? How much of it is there? And um, based off of are those things more sensitive to pollution and, and disturbances and things? Are they invasives? And then it'll give you that floristic quality index. And then based on how high that is or whatnot, then too, it'll say, OK, you have a good, super excellent floristic quality index. This community is awesome or this, you know, set of different plant communities is awesome. Really low, it might just be all reed canary grass. It's a zero for everything. It's across the whole thing, you know, really altered by disturbance. You get a really poor first quality index. So then we use that score and with along with our MinRAM and that kind of, you know, then feeds into that management classification that we use. So you got, you got some pretty flowers that are, so it's floristic, get a higher mark if it's pretty. I mean, if it's this one, and, you know, <laughs> since this one's pretty, yeah, this is actually from a bog um, in Eden Prairie. Um, there's a little floating bog or it's not like it's not that little. It's actually quite big. It was, I think, four acres or so. But um, yeah, this is, uh, I don't remember which species of sundew, but there's the sundew, some, uh, I don't remember which cranberry it was, but there's cranberry growing out and such like that. Yeah, this really cool. This was taken within the district. Yeah, this, right. this, yeah, I, this is one of our homes. Matt or myself. Yeah, all the pictures that are in this are either Matt, myself, or some of our interns have taken these. So these are all our photos. But yeah. Yeah, so really cool we found this. That one scored exceptional for not only just the overall um, uh, management classification, but first uh, um, quality, I'm pretty sure, was uh, also an exceptional for that one as well, at least in that um, in that uh, uh, plant community area, because there was three or four different technically plant communities. So there's like deep marsh, shallow marsh, the floating bog area, 
in the shrub scrub area. So that's that's part scored high though for sure. Yes, yes. So is the cranberry? Um we, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in Bear Path. This, so this is I don't know if this is one that people talk about. This is like the big bog area where it's probably probably is the one, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, it's really cool. Okay. Yeah, that actually, I'm pretty sure that was the picture because he was actually out assessing that one with me. So, but actually, this is also that same bog. This is the more shrub scrubbery than that bog. So, anyways, um, I've been talking about those management classifications that we get from getting all this data. So, based off of those min ram functional categories, FQA, um, it's sort of our first level of prioritization that we're using as far as, you know, that first step of, okay, here's like wetlands that are going to have a better chance of doing some sort of restoration, rehabilitation, um, creation. And so, um, the, these magic classifications are kind of sort of laying that base layer, which ones we're going to probably end up choosing from once we start doing the next round of assessments. Um, these are also used for regular purposes then too. So a project's going on, we need to know, okay, what is, you know, you know is this a medium level, a high level, low level, exceptional level wetland? And that will, you know, give a certain, that will um, de determine um, buffer widths per our rules. And also then to um, cities who are, uh, in charge of WACA, the Wetland Conservation Act around the district then too, they will sometimes ask for these and will use these as, you know, to supersede other min ramps have taken, just since they are a little bit more specific to some things, they might give a little higher level of um, uh, management classification. But, all right, so this is a quick just figure. Uh, so these are, as of just this last year, 2023 then, all the wetlands within the district that have been <laughs> assessed, um, and so you can see uh, blue is exceptional all the way down to red, which is a low quality. So not too many low quality, 156 out of the 1,050, I think, overall that are in this. As far as ones that are unclassified, there's some goofy bugs in that uh, Microsoft Access form. And so a good majority of those are actually have been assessed. We have to figure that out because whenever we type it all in and everything, it gives us, you know, just value. So, um, so there's quite a, so it says 92 that are unclassified, but that's not mean that 92 have not been walked. It's more probably like 20 have not been walked, but yeah, so not doing, you know, terrible as far as like, you know, having decent, you know, not low quality wetlands, the majority of them are medium 605, but yeah. And so the idea is with that next sort of level, you know, and we'll get this in just a second here too, we're starting to look at some more specific functions that we want to focus on within some of these, you know, bigger areas that might have more of an impact or ones that are upstream of a valuable water body or something like that. So, all right, speaking of, um, first off, this photo over here, this is um, pre-project photo of the Pioneer wetland restoration that we did down there off of uh, uh, Pioneer and what's the crosswords? Pioneer 101, yeah. So, um, as far as prioritizing what I kind of talked about it a little bit into that, it. so we've done our first round of wetland assessments. So going out, doing the MinRAM assessments, the FQAs, um, gathering all that data, doing the inventory. And so um, the process for ID and those sort of next level high um, uh, priority wetlands uh, breaks down to these three here. So special types of wetlands, so in sort of tamarack swamps. So, I mean, uh, wooded swamp area that's, you know, dominated by tamarack uh, trees or other more kind of, um, I don't want to say rare, but, you know, less common or, you know, that ones that would score higher on the FQA um, and get that higher FQ, uh, fluoristic quality index score plants within those types of wooded swamps would it be higher or a calcareous fence. Um, those are very high value wetlands throughout Minnesota. We don't really have too many of those around here. Um, next, uh, high level for potential for restoration, rehabilitation or protection. So, I mean, there's got to be a bunch of things. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the uh, Creek Restoration Action Strategy, but beyond just what we see out in the field there too, you got to, you know, how feasible is it, you know, as far as, you know, can we get, you know, adjacent, you know, landowners and um, stakeholders to agree on, you know, doing this project, especially if, you know, some of their land juts out in the wetland. Um, can we set aside money for it? What's the downstream value of that? Um, so things like that. Um, and then just focusing on improving wetland functions and values the district then too. So just overall, you know, where can we really start improving those? And a big part of that boils down to um, uh, when you have projects going on lots of times little wetlands, sometimes big wetlands are impacted by that. When people go to get wetland banking credits for that, it's usually outside the district. So where can we maybe incorporate that into that? So that's the one thing we're keeping in the back of our brains as we move forward with this. So, general, so generally hard to get the landowners on board? Um, from the little bit I, you know, really see of that and such and too, 
I haven't seen too much of that in the last few years. I mean, I've seen lots of the creek projects. Um, I mean, especially depending on you know how much it really impacts, it's more just like an adjacent thing. I don't think there's too much of a problem with that usually. I mean, I suppose it depends on who you're you know dealing with, who you know, who it is, how much you're actually be impacting their property. I mean, if you're bringing in you know a bunch of front end loaders and you know and excavators and such, you're you know might get a little bit more pushback if you know that path that they're going in and out of you know is sure. clearly right through just their lawn and so. But um, I mean, it's really dependent, but. I haven't heard of anything too much where it's been like, well, we're just going to scrap this whole thing just because we can't figure anything out. But that also goes into the planning, I'm sure, too. So, yeah. And then, um, oh, sorry. Thanks. Oh, yeah, no, no worries, worries. And then, um, so now looking forward, then, too, we're kind of starting to focus in, like I mentioned, some more specific functions to kind of focus off. So based off, you know, the year-end roundup in our kind of um, last little meeting here with Terry, myself, and some of our, um, our engineer folks and ecologists at BAR, we're looking specifically as of now at biodiversity, water quality, and then that water storage or flood attenuation to kind of be the kind of higher level of focus, seeing as those are ones that are going to have kind of big impacts that are, you know, also in sync with lots of the other things we're doing with creeks and with uh, lake um, management. But yeah. All right. And that was kind of like the big section. These actually are going to be a little bit shorter just because we do so quite a bit, a lot with uh, Wetland Conservation Act and then like our assessment for projects. But is there a little bit less in depth than that? But um, anyways, also Wetland Conservation Act. I'll be calling it WACA a bunch just because that goes a lot quicker. So if I say that, that's what that means. Um, so Wetland Conservation Act passed back in 1991. Um, just works to achieve net no loss of wetlands in Minnesota. So that means it's just regulating drainage and filling. So draining of wetlands by any sort of activity or even you know filling in with any sort of material. Um, that just doesn't mean soil. I mean, you can have a bunch of debris and things put into that, that would count as fill. Um, excavation of certain types of wetlands, so that's your, your shallow to deeper open water uh, wetlands, that's prohibited um, without, you know, certain uh, exceptions and such then too. And then just converting any wetland to a non-wetland. So that's what this regulates. Um, so local government units um, or the LGUs are responsible for administering this. We specifically are the LGU for Deep Haven and Shorewood. And so, and this is little parts of Deep Haven and Shorewood that are within the district. So not much once you get past Silver over in the Christmas Lake, you know, you're over in Minnehaha Creek territory. So it's very thin band, but we do get some applications for that. So in my time of being the person administering that, I think I've had two or three applications over the last three years. So not too many. Chan Haston probably had 15 this last year. Actually, probably, it's probably more than that, but um, 15 I can probably think about top of my head. So. Um, but yeah, with that though, yeah. Um, so um, the like I mentioned, the cities adjacent to us, then for the most part, are the ones administering the conserva uh, Wetland Conservation Act um, outside of those two cities. And so, um, well, also the things I do then along with this, besides just being LGU for those two uh, cities, um, reviewing applications and wetland delineations, um, a whole TEP meetings to re review that. So TEP, a technical evaluation panel. Um, so just a group of folks um, usually it contains uh, representative from Bowser. And so there's regional wetland specialists who are assigned to different areas. And so we have one for Hennepin County. We have a different one for Carver County. Um, they'll be a part of that. Cities usually involved in that, at least to some extent, or at least in the loop. Um, DNR, if it's a, um, a DNR regulated wetland. Um, sometimes the Army Corps of Engineers will get into that then too. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah. Um, County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District will also be a part of that. So Hennepin or Carver, depending on which side you're on. Um, if need be with some of these applications, um, if everything's not straightforward and cut and dry, or if you have any questions about that, onsite review is usually something that's pretty common with those, um, especially if it's something where there'll be a wetland impact or if you're you know uncertain about boundaries of a wetland, even if it's just determining the boundaries. Not all these applications have to do with wetland impacts. Some are just like, here's a wetland. Can you say that we're right about saying this is this big and that it's you know, this type. And part of the reason with that, then too, being really, you know, a stickler about reviewing those types of ones, then too, and making sure you're still looking at those, is that they might come along with a later application to do some sort of impact. And these um, uh, these decisions on these are good for five years. So if you say, here's a boundary, and they come back in later, and you didn't need to do a good review, and they have another application that's going to wipe out half of this, you know, they might be wiping out more than they thought, or they might be doing a project that comes up and they're actually taking out some of the wetland that was not delineated. And so all these applications are really important to really look at review. Yeah. 
but at the end of all this process, then and there's a bunch of timelines which we won't get into because they're very confusing and dumb. Um, a decision is made on the application. So whether it be somebody wants to come in and you know do huge impacts on wetland by banks outside of the district and do a project, or if they just want to you know determine the boundaries of a wetland, uh, that um, LGU has to make a decision within 60 days of receiving a complete application of saying, hey, this is you know we're approving this or we're denying this or we're approving this with conditions and then you can get into what those conditions might be. Uh, but uh, yeah. Are the TEP meetings for every application, how would the TEP meetings coordinate with the application? Yeah, yeah. So anybody on the TEP can ask to have a TEP meeting. Um, usually it will be the LGU saying, hey, I want to have a TEP to review this. Um, and around, I mean, within the district here then too, everybody I've worked with is pretty good about it. if there's something that, you know, they think should be reviewed, they will call a TEP meeting. Um, nobody's just kind of like just passing them along and saying approved, approved, approved. But um, yeah, I mean, it won't always be on site. Um, these, so these are always, um, it is uh, required that whoever the LGU is has to uh, notice all these uh, applications that come through. So within a certain time period to say, here's the application we got, please, you know, review it. And so everybody that's on the, the, the tap, which is kind of more or less those folks I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, should be reviewing them at least, you know, taking this, you know, a quick peek at them at the very least. But um, yeah, and then um, based off that, they might call a TEP meeting or like I said, you know, a member of the TEP can say, hey, I think we should go out and review this and look at this, which is up to the discretion of the LGU. But, you know, usually they're going to say, yes, let's review that. Because, you know, especially if it's somebody, you know, who's been doing this for 20 years, which a lot of these Bowser folks have been doing it for a long time and that's all they do. So usually if they say something, you want to get out there and you want to review it, but yeah. Right this all right so that's kind of more or less what goes on with the wetland conservation act of the district and then so wetland is assessments for district projects so um like i kind of sort of hinted at earlier whenever we do a big project if there is a wetland or thought there might be a wetland within the vicinity of the work area of that project we're going to go out we're going to do an assessment and we're going to do delineation so delineation is actually going out determining the boundaries of a wetland if there is a wetland even types of wetland uh, plant communities within it um, and then uh, actually you know taking measurements of where that is and everything too and that becomes once again like I said you know that's record for five years after that um, so this kind of becomes another one of the sort of fun parts of my job because I get to go out and do the delineations do the survey work but uh, so this is actually the outline of the uh, area from that pioneer wetland um, so obviously beforehand you can see these just Ditches are here on these three lots, one, two, three, right there, that were on site before the project happened. But um, straight line is because that's where the parcel line is. Yes, yes. So, but um, yeah, so um, what happens is uh, we have a project coming up. Uh, actually, this, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it's slated to start, but I'll be out in the field here in the next little bit here, especially since it's pretty warm out now. It's going to seemingly stay like that. But Upper Bluff Creek, we'll be doing that creek project up there. So I'll be doing something similar going out. Finding you know the boundaries of where the wetlands are out there. Um, there's quite a large wetland that feeds in the Bulf Creek, so I'll be uh, delineating that one. Um, we might do other survey work then too, so just elevations across. You know, it's kind of it'll usually supplement the other survey work that our engineers have done, or sometimes you know depending on if it's a big open space like this, we might use the majority of that just you know because we can save a little bit of money if I'm out there doing it as opposed to an engineer from bar. But uh, or sometimes we'll go out you know both at the same time. We'll do something like that. I've been actually out with Jeff and some other folks when Jeff was at bar doing survey stuff out on uh, I think Riley Creek when I first started oh, but, yeah but um, yeah so but um, you know we'll do that um, then I'll go through the process then too I will submit an application for that so usually um, that application uh, can vary I mean if, if we're not going to do any work within that it'll just be one of those boundary type ones if we are going to be doing some sort of impact for the most part usually it's just a temporary impact because obviously we're out to restore the creek area so if we're or in this case of this one we're, we're doing a wetland restoration so um usually it's considered like a temporary impact or improvement impact so we're not deleting wetland space and usually we're trying to either increase it or at least you know increase function from it but yeah and then uh, you the yep yep so yes yeah, so i specifically reviewed it as far as oh so this has been chan has and so um I don't remember if Joe said, I don't think Joe said L was at the city yet. No, it was before he was out there. But so the wet, the Wetland Conservation Act uh, person, you're usually the um, water resource coordinator at the city, which, yeah, I think most of the cities have a specific water resource coordinator. So at least all the ones that do WACA. So, so you're the 
questions. Yeah. Just on the slide. So you have your delineations kind of around the on the outside. Like how often do you have to deal with something where there's like an island of non wetland in the middle? Like you should like get out into the into it into it like evaluate. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean for sure. And I mean that is something that I know I've heard people say has happened. Luckily with the delineations I've been able to do for the district, it's usually not the case. It's usually well, like the last one I did was um the middle of Riley Creek one. So it's just a nice deep pond everywhere. So I didn't have to go out in the middle, but that does happen. Um I mean and that's one of those things in two word extensive, you know aerial review, which is a part of delineation. It's not just going out in the field. You do lots of um, antecedent weather uh, review, aerial photo review, um, especially if it's a big site. You want to look to see, okay, historically, what's been out here? Um, what caused the changes? Um, were wetlands created because of, you know, actions taken, you know, by construction or things like that? Creating some wetlands that might end up becoming incidental wetlands or wetlands that have can skirt some of the rules of uh, WACA. Um, is there a big field out there that used to be all wetland? And we could say, well, this was wetland. So um, so with that, then too, you might find little pockets or little high areas then too. And so it's, you know, very important to get out into those spots and check those in too. But, and those are things when we're doing uh, our Wetland Conservation Act um, application reviews as the TEP, uh, as TEP member or as, uh, as the LGU, we'll look at those sort of things also. And once again, if it's, if it's a big enough site, then too, 100% of the time we're out there looking at it, but. Yeah, and I usually expect that then too from the cities from the couple these I've done then too because they're usually pretty big. So are like, let's come out with me and look at these because I want to make sure I'm you know getting all the wetland in here. So I will encourage that. Not everybody does, but usually if you're working to do a wetland kind of, uh, restoration, they seem to encourage that. But yeah. Um. So the idea of wetland donation, I kind of went into it a little bit, but um, once again, just identifying the presence and the boundaries of the wetland. Um, three main things that are going to determine whether you have that wetland are the, you know, we can always come to three parameters. So it's going to have wetland hydrology, wetland soils, and hydrophytic vegetation. Those are all key. Um, in weird sort of, there might be weird circumstances or on regular circumstances where one of these things maybe might not be there. Um, for instance, a drought, you know, last three years we've had drought conditions. Um, there are special rules and there's also, also special considerations for looking at things like um, vegetation or hydrology in those sort of cases. Um, even with soils, um, soils are the ones that take longest to be established just because it's, you know, dozens and dozens and you know, hundreds of years sometimes of water slowly sleeping down, pulling, you know, different minerals out of the soils and then dragging them down further and further. You get these depleted layers, so layers that are, you know, more or less depleted of these minerals and everything. Um, that can even be messed up, you know, if you have lots of digging and such in the wetland. Um, you can have all this mixture and such, and too, and you might not be able to find those soils as easily. That being said, usually then too, on a, especially on a bigger site, you're taking multiple pits on either side of where you think the wetland is and where you think the upland is to really make sure, okay, where's that boundary here? But, um, but yeah, so those are always the three things you're looking for. Um, and like I mentioned too, doing lots of historical aerial photo review, map review, and seed weather, topographic map review, all sorts of things, but yeah. Yeah. Are there st agency standards for definitions of wetland soils so you can reference? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, NRCS has this really thick book just of different types of wetlands all across the three different uh, main regions within Minnesota then, too. So some of them might be a wetland soil in, you know, the Midwest area and the uh, yeah, lower part of, um, of Minnesota, it might not be. And so... Um, and it's really confusing, too, because the wording, the way it's worded, it's one of those things, even folks have been doing this for a long time, you know, um, uh, I, cause I know I for sure do it. I've been doing only doing this for like last, you know, five years or so, but you have to kind of reread it. Like, am I reading this right? But no, there are specifics, you know, and that's usually saying, okay, this much down from your, your, um, surface, you know, is you're seeing this further down from that, you're seeing this type of, you know, it's a situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have them split up um, for, you know, certain of these different soil types, they call them, which is more like, it's more like a makeup of soil types. Um, they will be specific some in some cases to the different the three different uh, land regions in Minnesota. So and that's partly is also based off into you know you get sandier soils in some parts of Minnesota, you know more you know uh, loamy soils in parts of Minnesota. So the big guy you take out with you? Yeah, I usually have that one. And actually, um, Bowser they have made these awesome little field guides for um, hydrology and uh, soil um, indicators that you can take along too. So it's little um, bound books that are really really small. And so lots of times though, then too. Um, as far as plants go, you know, especially if you're in a, a wetland where you're like, hey, you know, here's this cool bog. I, you know, I know that's some sort of sundew, but I don't know what it is, you know, which happened with that one. 
and some of the other plants out there then too. Um, lots of photos, depending on what type of plant it is. If you know it's like, oh, I can maybe take a sample or maybe I shouldn't because that might be rare. Um, sometimes we'll take samples, but uh, yeah, I mean, and I have lots of, you know, that's usually the one that are, the big books are the vegetation books because especially with grasses, grasses are, I don't like, I don't like grasses. <laughs> Yeah, there's like 127 different types of specific Carex genus sedges in Minnesota. I don't like identifying grasses. Those are fine. I don't like identifying grasses, but because um, they're just weird and hard. But um, no, yeah, so usually that's the ones that we bring out. And then also with um, as far as looking at hydro, uh, the hydric soils into, we have specific uh, month cell color book. So it's literally a book full of different colors that have chromas, values and such in them that you can you know say you're actually looking at the dirt underneath it moistened up, you know, to see, you know, is it this color? Okay, so since it's this color, that matches the description of this soil type that I was mentioned earlier. That's, you know, the first eight inches of the soil, you know, with these little features inside of it. And so it gets pretty in depth, but yeah. Yeah, it's the vegetation books that are the big books I have, but they usually stay here. The photos come back with me. Yeah, and that's all I got, so. regulate how much wetland that's what they can I don't know give away like or what they can do with it or how to 90 do. yeah so it's it's more like um well first off the the LGU and then you know usually you know hopefully with you know the you know the lots of input from the tap will decide, okay, is this project even warranted? Did you do all of, did they do all their work where it's like, you know, hey, we had no other option to, you know, do work and build this thing right here. Um, and that's one of those things until you get to kind of, it's, 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 it gets a little back and forth and too, I mean, cause you know, some of these projects, you know, so was depending, especially if, you know, what personal biases might be, you know, some people might think none of these projects are worth it. Some people are like, well, you know, this is bringing, you know, commerce to the area and such. They're totally worth it. And, you know, it's it's finding that balance then too. Um, so we look in those cases, we look at, okay, well, is there another plot of land that has no wetlands on it that you could build this at that, you know, is reasonable for you to purchase? Well, we don't really look too much at then the purchase price into like financial, you know, uh, savings for the applicant. It's not something to really look at, you know. So unless it's like, you know, this plot of land that's, you know, 20 acres is, you know, however many thousand dollars an acre. And this one over here is like 20 times more than that. We maybe might consider that, especially if it's something where, okay, this is a facility that is gonna, you know, a bunch of the folks that work at this facility are currently driving an hour to get to it and such. And this is much closer to everybody. It's more centralized and, you know, and it's also, you know, an Excel service station. So it's gonna create, you know, better, uh, you know, report times for certain areas and such than too. And, we would consider things like that. That being said, we'll just put them for the ringer and say, okay, what can you do to make this so you have the least amount of impacts? But um, so when it gets to that point where it's like, okay, we can start to accept this and such then too, based off the type of wetland that they are going to be impacting, especially if those are permanent impacts, um, that's when they start looking at uh, banking credits and then based off those types and such then too. And also the part of the, um, the state that you're in, um, you'll have to purchase a certain amount of credits at a certain um, replacement rate. So if you're taking out this many acres, you have to replace with this many acres, and that might be, you know, more than a one-to-one, -one, you know, especially depending on the type of wetland. So, yeah. The LGU generally direct them they can purchase wetland credits or do wetland banking anywhere in the state? So there are specific bank areas, depending where you're at, which is part of also the reason, then too, that uh, one of the big you know, ideas behind our um, wetland restoration program is looking at, okay, how can we find ways to maybe bring some of that back into here and do restorations here? Because um, unfortunately, like, you know, I don't, I think we're service area nine, eight or nine for us, but I don't remember which counties that is, but it's outside the district was where, so folks can buy, just buy credits from there because that is the service area for, you know, this part of the metro. So unfortunately, it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, they're replacing, but they're destroying specific functions within an area lots of times. And those functions just gone there because they're not doing anything in, not always, but in those in lots of cases when it's just, they're only purchasing bank credits, they're not doing anything to replace those functions within the watershed or the sub watershed that they're working in. So, and that might go back to like, okay, is, if this is gonna be warranted, that might be one of those, um, uh, those uh, approvals with um, certain considerations we might say is like, okay, so we're going through and looking at your plans. If you can do this and have this many less impacts, or maybe the water feature you have on the property can do this much as far as storage and things and such too, and maybe replace some of those functions 
LG is be more likely to say, OK, hey, we're going to you know, be more likely to consider this. And because of that, you know, approve it then too. So in a lot of cases, I mean, because, you know, that LG hold, does hold a lot of power. These folks are going to be willing to work with them, especially when they realize, OK, you know, we can do this feasibly or, you know, it's going to make this process a lot smoother, you know, or, or not have to worry about my project's going to get denied. So. Most applicants, do they already own the property when they apply? Yeah, so yeah. Bit like a developer, it's already purchased the property. In in my experience so far, we don't even like I said, it's only been about five years, and sitting on the um, TEPs and um, doing stuff with uh, LGU, this has only been about three years. But most of the time, yes. Which sometimes can also, you know, be one of these things where they just buy and they say, "I want to do this," and then they realize they can't. Um, especially the type of the type of the project, then too, they might not, you know be allowed in general to build on that. Like if you buy, you know, little half acre, you know, little big half acre lot, I guess, you know, if you're doing a house and such, um, there might be enough wetland area on there where it's just not buildable and they cannot be zoned to build there. Um, I'm not sure on the specific numbers for that, but that is something that can happen. And actually if I was uh, out with, um, I think the city of Minnetonka just this last uh, summer, reviewing a um, uh, application and because folks want to look, hey, where are the wetlands on here? They had not purchased yet, and they were going to purchase this piece of land to buy uh, or to build a house on it. And after speaking with um, uh, the Minnetonka folks and everything afterwards, uh, we found more wetland than it was delineated initially. But because of that, then too, we found that they almost certainly would not be able to uh, be able to permitted to uh, build there at all, regardless. So, so they luckily they did their you know they did their homework and research before they purchased the property. But it's one of those things then too where sometimes we got to say sorry, but can't build here for whatever reason you know, and there's out that money but for the watershed district what say do they have in anything if it's like the city of chanhassen or city of eden prairie you said they aren't the lgu for most oh yeah yeah so i mean in that case um we're just relying on our rules so i mean i mean obviously whatever is the most um I don't want to say harsh, but whatever the most strict rule, you know, about the water resources, the one that's going to end up, you know, taking president. Obviously, they can't just say, "Well, I want to choose a lesser amount over here," just because. But um, and in lots of cases, our rules are a little bit more, you know, strict, you know, about you know impacts to water bodies and such. And too, thankfully, because some of these ones, even with the uh, Wetland Conservation Act, you know, with things like wetland banking or such, and too, our rules don't cover all that stuff. But they are a little bit, tend to be a little more stricter than some of those, which is kind of nice because sometimes, you know, it's. Can prevent Does some have to like get a variance for like the wetland bucket I mean, and stuff. Like yeah, that? yeah. So that's you know sure. for us then yeah. I mean, if, depending on what they want to do, if it's still going to impact those, you know, and it's going to be something that would not jive with our rules, and yeah, they'd have to get a variance. And of course, that's at the discretion of the board whether or not they want to approve mm -hmm. that. And then of course, you know, in a lot of cases, and too, that applicant and their engineers, whoever do design project, will work with our engineers to say, okay, here's what you could potentially do, and then yeah, we'll be you know the board will be advised on that whether or not they. You know, it's up to, to Scott's standards. So I usually just tend to trust his standards then too, because he's been doing this for a while. He knows his stuff. But yeah. is there ever a scenario where construction stormwater pond could be classified as a wetland? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean like how long would it take for like the soil those soils to develop, you know, and like you know, the the the, the plant will really develop around them somewhat naturally. Mm -hmm. it's like you know, I have is there a scenario where that would be possible? I mean, so to my understanding with stormwater ponds and too, especially just all the way they're kind of looked at, there's they are just looked at as like a stormwater pond and everything. Um, I mean, as far as like if we're looking just strictly at the soils and everything, and as far as that's developing outside, like maybe 20 years down the line, it was not used as a stormwater pond for whatever reason, you know, pipes are cut off to it and it's just a pond sitting there. Um, I mean, it could happen fairly quickly, especially if there's just constant water there. I mean, I say fairly quickly, that's still years and years. But it might happen more, you know, quicker than, you know, 50 years, 100 years, just because there's, you know, just a lot of water. So it also depends on how much that water is draining and such then, too, because the amount um, uh, of just uh, um, capillary movement of that water down through the soil, then, too, it might be pulling more um, nutrients down with it if it's draining faster, or maybe even just those conditions of it being stagnant there, that soil, you know, um, Actually, I suppose at that point, that'd probably pull down more nutrients because it's just saturated longer. But it'd probably be quicker, though, for sure, than if you had more like, you know, a little prairie pothole or like a um, a temporary flooded little basin, which, you know, drains out pretty quickly because there's more water that's constantly moving that those nutrients down and soaking them down. But it also depends on what the soil is like under it. Yeah. But maybe. 
I mean, oh yeah, so yeah, so I suppose to answer the question, yeah, I suppose eventually maybe, but as long as as long as it's like as long as it's looked at as a stormwater pond, or the city's like, hey, this is one of our stormwater ponds, and stormwater ponds rules for that, at least as far as I know with that. Um, but yeah. Could you come in and assess it and do those things? Say, hey, yeah, I mean, and, now and, a and for some of these, then too, um, I have assessed some of the stormwater. I mean, quite a bit actually. Then too, some of them have you know more like wetland fringes and such, and then for whatever reason, there is a situation where it's like, well, we want to look at this as a. A wetland. Um, we have assessed those then too in that. Plus, they they also go very quickly then too. So it's not like something where we're wasting time and resources assessing those. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, is that so? When you if you need to bank or get a credit, is that for preservation or restoration? Um, are you like making another wetland somewhere else better, or are you just protecting these wetlands? So one of the main reasons, way many ways this happens is um, usually there'll be like an area where a big huge restoration has happened, and folks can they like they generate credits from them too. So you're purchasing. I'm not sure exactly fully how that works because a lot of these uh, credit ones and then too, it's usually been like kind of reviewing, you know. On the tap side of things, but um, so those those credits will be generated by like some sort of project like that, or like by you know a restoration or um something like that of a wetland, and so they have a certain amount based off of that that they can buy from them. So, but um, I'm pretty sure I have to double check this. But I'm pretty sure that you could say here's the upcoming project, or say no, but it has to be an established bank is the thing though. So that's an established bank that is approved by Bowser. Normally. Yeah. Where you wet leaves on their turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get to the tiles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but there is a formal process. Yeah. It takes them through effort or gets a point where they get a check for mm -hmm. someone buying their credits. Which leads to my question, which is you know that it's happening in the city with the chance has to be in the prairie and everybody wants to get rid of a, a wetland. That's a, a problem project that they want to move forward and what when, when do we become bankrupt when do we say no enough banking here we need our wetlands in a, in a city or a certain area a defined area so what are we doing or how how can we help make sure that that doesn't happen yeah i mean um that's kind of what I'm it comes down to like who can who is you know canon is willing to put in you know hard you know i don't want to say hardship but you know stricter guidelines about that um because I mean that's what it comes down to. It's like you know, well, legally, you know, we can here and there. So, um, I'm sorry, you yeah. say you can legally, you can. Oh yeah. So, like, if, for instance, you know, if somebody wants to come in, you know, and say, you know, over the next couple of years, you know, another, you know, half of our wetlands are removed from the district. If someone wants to come in, and remove another one. I mean, if they're going throughout the routes and you know it's deemed, you know, it follows WACA guidelines and such, or they're able to get banking credits for it, then too, then they, you know. They can, so it's it's more or less, you know, do those do those some of those rules with you know WACA or maybe at a local level something may be uh, established to make you know that more you know a, a, a more stricter process you know and make it so it's you know and and that might and that's part of the reason that, you know we're starting to look at uh, our our overall just wetland restoration program is. You know what is what are these impacts and what are these functions and you know how can we start looking at this in a way where it's like okay well. If we lose this function, you know, you know, from these wetlands over here, what's that going to do to downstream water bodies? And maybe that's something that you know can be eventually used for, you know, our rules. Maybe that's something that you know can eventually be used as a case to, for things like whack of rules and such thing too. But yeah, it boils down to what those rules are in place. Unfortunately, I mean, I thought you said our rules didn't have banking. Provisions. Ours don't. No, no. I mean, so I mean, when it comes to that point, you know, I mean, is that some? I how does that? That's what I kind of was yeah, the yeah. first question. If we don't have banking. How can how does that work together? And so that's more on the side then is like okay, well, do we you know need to have stronger rules for certain impacts and such, or you know because it's going to affect downstream water quality or even just the water quality of that? But that gets to a point though where it's beyond you know a lot of you know decisions I'm making on this because I'm doing lots of stuff. So. Yeah. They are the LGU, mm -hmm. so they it, and you're on the committee that the technical yeah, cap, um, but it's ultimately the city that gets to make the decision. Yeah. Um, what do they? Can they make? I mean, obviously, they would have to come to a variance to the district to meet district rules. 
right? Mm -hmm. That seems, sounds like it. But can the district turn down the variance? Oh, yeah. I mean, so. The they, city decision to allow the project, but we say no, then. Yeah. So, I mean, if yeah. you have to get all your permits. So, I mean, if, you know, we can't necessarily do anything really about banking as a district right now. But yeah. in that case, so yeah, I mean, if it come, when, it come, when it comes to that step, though, I mean, they can get approved for a WACA permit, but if we have some other sort of rule that says, well, oh, but they might exit. need a permit. They, you're saying they might. Oh, they will. Oh, they will. Yeah. Yeah. Approved through the WACA, the LGU's WACA decision. Mm -hmm. But they also need but our then permit, they, may, too. they also have to come to us. And we could deny. Mm -hmm. And most of these projects have permits through us then too, just because it the proximity to some sort of water body. So then why does our rules not address that? I guess so our, our rules do address anything that leaves the site. Mm -hmm. And wherever um, you know they define this is our project, any water going off that site has to meet our rules. So a lot of times they end up putting in a retention pond in a different place. So it becomes kind of like a wetland, but the detention pond, you can get more bounce and that. Okay. So the, the quality of the wetland and all that isn't maybe part of our rules. Right. That yeah, no. aspect. Yeah. Yes. Last time it's quality usually about discharge and water storage. Yes. Okay. Rates, yeah. Rate waters. Can't harm, you know, according to our rules, can't be any worse than it was before they got rid of the wetland. So it's like the LGU, the WACA, is the actual physical wetland impacts destruction. Ours is what is the result of that? Mm -hmm. So the the water, but we don't get to say yes or no, they can destroy the wetlands. The LGUs, mm -hmm. the WACA, the WACA authority. Mm -hmm. But then we get to say, well, the water's and like David well, they say, work with the engineer, yeah. Of, you know, the watershed engineer, and they might end up with a uh, storage place in underneath the parking lot mm -hmm. and in the path. They might end up with a few stormwater ponds in different locations. And um, we frequently end up doing variances because our rules say that uh, the stormwater pond has to be within a certain elevation. And uh, sometimes, you know, if that stormwater pond is now gone, you can't really uh, consider it anymore. If you put it downstream a little ways, you capture all the water there. Uh, this water leaving the site is still it meets all our rules. Then, you know, what? Why do we care that it isn't the same elevation? You know, if it's not going to be a flood risk for them or anyone else. But that's one of the reasons we're trying to kind of look at the value of the green space too, because, you know, for centuries, they've been saying, oh, we got lots of green space. It's all mowed, you know, turf grass. Okay. Was it biodiversity on the, one of the metrics that you're Yep, yep. That's for a wetland evaluation. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. which which feeds into those uh, management classifications, which the part of our rules that that kind of influences then is um, if okay if there's gonna be some sort of impact around the wetland, then there's you know when the project goes up into there needs to be a certain amount of buffer space then between where that project is and the wetland, but but it could be used for things in the future though too. I mean if you know down the line you know looking at okay do we, we need to change some things here and there for the rules and such and too, hopefully it'd be something where we'd probably look at maybe like some of these wetland functions if it's specifically a wetland. You know, related rule, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The weather may not be like a thousand weapons. You can that's on the website. You can go and look. Hopefully look this is what the rating is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we so in the on the EHAP page, we have a bunch of maps that were generated. So those are those are readily available. Um we don't have a wetland specific page. That's what we're working on yeah. this this year putting together. Um, because currently we, we don't. Um, there is a wetland program report that is dr in draft mode right now that'll be released to the public once the board approves. Um, so that has a lot of information, has maps on there and stuff. So yeah, that'll give you a lot more detail. Just yeah. it hasn't been released yet. Another question is, you know, just to figure out where they all are and assess them. 
is there, you know, are there some may go back and reassess them, like watching the quality either degrade or move? Is that something that's on the on that huge list? With yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I mean, this first round then with these have, two has been kind of more so. Okay, some of the earlier ones we had, you know, some interns who were seasonal interns doing some of the earlier ones, and two, not to say that they did bad work, but you know. They were, you know, learning it on the fly and going and such. Even some of the early ones I did when I was, you know, first learning and such then too. But um, yeah, I mean, eventually then too, I'm sure it'll be something then where it's like maybe here and there we're like, oh, hey, we want to reassess these ones. Or if we know a project's coming up, um, when the city's um, as part of like, you know, a member of the TEP or when the cities reach out about specific um, uh, min rams for certain wetlands, I might uh, go back and maybe at the very least do some, you know, just rechecking up some of the um, remote stuff. If I'm able to get in the field, I might recheck that even. Or if there is an actual, like, you know, insight tech meeting, I might recheck some of those and update those as well. So it's one of those things where hey, if there's a chance to do it, especially, you know, given time and whatnot, for sure, they will be at least slowly over time, you know, depending where they're at, which ones they are, will be updated. But yeah. Zach, I'm thinking something too that would be good for this wetland page. And and, and just help my confusion as well is to, you know, I like it's a good diagram. Everyone knows I like a good diagram, but um, how how those things align together with the LGU and the WACA and our rules and how all of that works together. Yeah, so sure. I think it would be, yeah. again, I mean. And kind of a de decision tree. Yeah, well, we have that that very detailed flow chart for um, the regulatory or the permit application program if you do something similar for. Yeah, yeah, that'd be easy. Not the wetland we, stuff. So. At that point, then two piles have. So, well, in, in planning for like a more sp like wetland specific, you know, longer than just a quick couple paragraphs page, um, um, including some of that stuff. But also, there'll probably be a lot of links then too. So, if you want to really get into the weeds of it, then too, you can go and see, okay, what's it like going through a wetland application? Because um, a lot of those uh, resources and two that are outside of our rules and such, then too, um, because it's a Bowser site, then too. But those would for sure be things on there as well. Yeah. What, what's the best wetlands in our district? Like, if you're like, go and check this one out, it's really a great one, it's healthy. It's oh, that unfortunately, I want to bear pass pretty often. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you bike by it in the trail? <laughs> um, no, no, it's um, <laughs> it's on the other side of the, the um, entrance booth, and that's it's on the north side, but. Um, I don't know. There's some uh, there's some pretty cool ones uh, just all around. Even over by Rice Marsh, like I don't, I don't remember who was all. If anybody was on the uh, this last uh, bike ride, but um, even some of the ones around there. I mean, lots of it is just really you know when you, especially when you get really close to Rice Marsh, you know, cattail, uh, deep water, uh, uh, deep marsh uh, wetlands there. But some of those little ones are even just coming up into that big area on the uh, whether it be the south uh, southeast side. Um, it's you know. For how much you know, little bits of like creek and area popped up there. So that's a pretty nice looking wetland. There's a couple actually around that. If you keep moving uh, west along that uh, southern trail, then too, there's a couple little pothole sort of uh, wooded wetlands. Then too, that when there actually is water, then you know, I have some little bits of uh, some uh, seasonal vegetation growing in them too. But I always find those ones to be really cool. Ones that people you know, I don't know, especially late in like August, September, walk by or drive by, and they don't realize it's a wetland. But early on, especially when you have you know flooded conditions and such, it's you know it can be pretty cool. But oh, that um one just right up here uh, off of yeah. is that is that one Edenbrook? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That one's got. I mean, that one's really accessible for people in terms of word box. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I mean, um, I mean, and even with, with it having a lot of that being really thick, just, you know, tall cattails in some of that area too, there's quite a bit of diversity out there. I was two years ago, I think is when I had walked and assessed all those ones out there, but yeah, you go tromping into those a little bit and you find a lot of stuff, but um, no, there's, I mean, there's quite a bit out there. Um, yeah. So. I'd say walking only trails and body Need to ride my bike over there. And do your homework. <laughs> you to allow it. A question. So we do. There's a points process for projects that I don't really know that much about. Does the wetland quality factor into the points a project is assigned? I don't know. You're talking about just like general projects, like any sort just of project we do, or the prop when the board votes for a project. I mean, does that wetland quality of things? Is that part of the points process? I don't know, David, is that part of the points process? So that's a good question, and I don't know the answer. But by the time it gets to the board, engineering is already, I'm sure Terry will. Yeah.
we think like a family and uh, you know, but more strict rules and uh, <laughs> you know my next uh, then, uh, develop, then my develop area. But, but just sort of like objective, getting objective measures of when you make these assessments and you have all these priorities, it's like, is there a value that goes to some that's used or is it yeah, yeah. management mostly and we just prioritize? It? Yeah, well, I mean, with those, those management classifications, um, I mean, those will speci like give specific like three, four levels then of, you know, how much, you know, that buffer needs to be around as far as our rules go. And with um, with WACA then too, um, they have, I mean, those management classifications, there's like a sort of parallel version of that within WACA then too, where it'll say, depending on, you know, quality of that, they might have to, um, I think that it's going to affect banking for sure. But um, things like that. So, I mean, yeah, the quality of the wetland specifically overall is like, a, you know, the overall wetland, whether it's a complex or it's just with WACA then within the rule. Yeah, yeah, ours most kind of it more um, kind of comes down to um, those buffers that we um, enforce around the wetland. Related to that, um, in thinking about banking, right, when you have like those, those high quality wetlands, it, does the district and the LGUs, are they able to say like, nope, you're not touching those, I don't care if you're going to pay for banking. You're, you're not paying for those versus if it's a low quality wetland, it sees your bill, like, yeah, whatever, it's low quality, it's it's better to pay for high quality banking someplace else and try to preserve this this low quality. Bank. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't really specifically ran into that uh, situation, at least where it's going to be a huge impact. Um, up around, uh, like, there's some trail stuff going on around Lake Ann where there's some high quality and exceptional ones, but they're just redoing trails and it's the city and they're trying to do as much as they can not to do anything with that. But I mean, in the end, the LGU can like make those decisions. It just depends on how much recourse the applicant might have and you know if you know whether or not they're gonna you know be litigious about them after that happens because um i mean that being said then too if if the lgu and then you know you hopefully the tep is you know helping advise them and such especially their wetland uh um specialists but um really bolster up a case of why we're not letting them touch this or, you know and then part of that might be you know just really digging in and saying okay well you didn't do this this or this you know trying to find this site or you know building out your project it could be something as simple as like you gave us one project design and they have to at least provide i think it's three because they have to have two at least two uh non-build ones and then their actual project and um for alternatives but um but i mean yes yeah, so, i mean it's it's one of those things where they yeah they could do that but that's the thing that too, the LGU is going to make sure that they're really solid with that thing too. You know, otherwise that might be, depending on who the applicant is, they might be facing a lawsuit, <laughs> unfortunately. Ultimately, people just need to meet what the rules are, and if the rules allow for all that, whatever it allows for. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ironic when you think about it, the wetland conservation there. Gives you a pass to fill up your wetlands. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's some cases too, like with like deeper water wetlands. I mean, it's a lot stricter and, you know, it's a lot harder. So, I mean, even just based off of that, the LG could probably shut it down pretty easily, saying, like, well, this is, you know, a deep marsh wetland and you want to fill in this much. So, we're just going to say no to that because it's not worth it and you can find other ways to do this. Or even if it's like a special type, like those special types I mentioned, there are special types that WAC considers. It's like, no, no, you're not touching those. You cannot, you know, touch, you know, this calcareous fen. So, but. So you said, though, I think early in the presentation that basically there's no net loss in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. So if there is an impact of some sort, if it is not mitigated on site, then... That's the law of it. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't have any wetlands on the west side of Minnesota. Right. It doesn't, it's by water. They still like mm -hmm. that watershed. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. That's uh, something for the, the uh, new... of the guy at the legislature. The lobbyist. The lobbyist. Thank you. It's a good one. So a little late to bring it up. Hey, Maybe next year. This is a good one. But it takes every bit oh, no. of our I understand. Yes. For getting all our priorities. So suppose we could just deny all permits and they raise the issue. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Zach? Zach, thank you very much. Most definitely, yeah.